This episode of The Curbsiders is sponsored by the American College of Physicians in celebration of National Internal Medicine Day on October 28th. ACP provides its 163,000 members with lifelong education, clinical support, practice resources, professional development, and advocacy resources. The Curbsiders podcast is for entertainment, education, and information purposes only, and the topics discussed should not be used solely to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any diseases or conditions. For the more, the views and statements expressed on this podcast are solely those of those and should not be interpreted to reflect official policy or position of any entity, aside from possibly cash like moral hospital and affiliate outreach programs, if indeed there are any. In fact, there are none. Pretty much, we are responsible if you screw up. You should always do your own homework and let us know when we're wrong. Well, we're back, Paul, tonight. Hello. And Stuart's here, Paul. Can you believe it? <laughs> Stuart's here. Oh, what a treat. What a it's joy. Been, it's been so long, Stuart. This is this is no, the no. Curbsiders. We're going to do a physical exam show tonight. We're going to be talking about shortness of breath. And Stuart, you showed up just for this. Thank you. You're welcome. Paul, before we get into this, can you can you remind the audience, what is it that we do on this show? Why Why are we here? Happy to, as always, Matt. We are the Internal Medicine Podcast. We use expert interviews to bring you clinical pearls and practice changing knowledge. And tonight, the great Justin Burke has brought us a special guest to talk to us about a specific portion of the physical examination. So rather than hammering on like I usually do, I'm going to pass the mic to him and let him talk about what this show is about and who's here to help us. Thanks, Paul. Great setup. This physical exam series was made with the assistance from the Society of Bedside Medicine and funding from the New York Academy of Medicine. On the series, we're focused on evidence-based physical exam and how to critically integrate exam maneuvers into our clinical decision-making process. We have a fantastic conversation with our guest today, Dr. Brian Garibaldi. He's an expert clinician, educator, pulmonologist, and intensivist. He's co-president of the Society of Bedside Medicine, associate program director of the Osler Medical Residency Program at Johns Hopkins, where he leads curriculum development and implementation. He is also the director of the Johns Hopkins Biocontainment Unit, which means that he can take care of patients with Ebola. (laughs) <laughs> he discusses the approach to a hypothesis driven exam. Just exam. exclusively that. They're probably all, all the time. <laughs> he discusses the approach to a hypothesis driven exam for a patient with dyspnea and helps us address the best maneuvers to guide clinical decision making. Without further ado, let's get to it. Hey, Justin, got a question for you. Why hey, is it that you should never jog and complain at the same time? You'll uh, get wind. I don't know. Because it makes you a little SOB. Looks <laughs> <laughs> pretty good. All right. Welcome back. Yeah. (laughs) ACP wants you to help celebrate National Internal Medicine Day on October 28th. Share your internal medicine pride by spreading your I Am Proud message all year long, and especially on National Internal Medicine Day. I am proud to be an internist because it is a genuine privilege and an honor to help guide my patients through a complicated health system and to help them meet their own health goals. ACP provides easy, fun ways for you to celebrate at acponline.org forward slash NIMD. You can download posters and a timeline of internal medicine milestones to share in your workplace or online. You can update your social media profile picture to include a National Internal Medicine Day frame, or you can customize and create your own posts, share social media posts from ACP and other internists, or just like and comment on ACP posts. Flood the internet with Internal Medicine Pride on October 28th. Recognize a colleague and spread the love for internal medicine. Be sure to tag at ACP internists and use the hashtags National Internal Medicine Day, hashtag I am proud, and hashtag I am essential. Visit acponline.org forward slash NIMD to jumpstart your celebration. Physical exam can be overwhelming given that there are so many exam maneuvers. A part of this series is to dive into the literature and focus on the reported test characteristics of these common maneuvers and how to best use them for a hypothesis driven exam. To understand how the physical exam affects a diagnosis, it's helpful to understand the concepts of pretest probability, likelihood ratios, and post-test probability. As a quick review, pretest and post-test probabilities are the probabilities of a specific diagnosis before and after a test. When we see a patient in front of us, we base our pretest probability for that specific diagnosis on prevalence in the community, initial clinical information, and general gestalt. Each exam maneuver is then a clinical test with its own characteristics including sensitivity and specificity for a given diagnosis. These are determined by previous studies. Using these characteristics, we can calculate a likelihood ratio, which can then be used to adjust our post-test probability for a given diagnosis. A positive likelihood ratio measures how much a positive test affects the probability of a specific diagnosis, while a negative likelihood ratio measures how much a negative test or lack of a test affects the probability of a given diagnosis. 
Using Fagan's nomogram, a clinician can then take the pretest probability of a diagnosis, use the likelihood of ratio of an exam maneuver, and then determine the post-test probability to make a diagnosis. In this episode, we pulled data from four sources, the McGee's Evidence-Based Physical Diagnosis Textbook, the JAMA Rational Clinical Exam Series, the JAC State-of-the-Art Review on the Role of the Clinical Exam in Patients with Heart Failure, and a narrative review by Ben Bassett et al. in the Journal of General Internal Medicine from 2010. Now, let's get started with a case. Mrs. Shirley Huffington is a 65-year-old woman with a 30-pack year smoking history, reported long-standing hypertension and high cholesterol. She is requesting a same-day appointment for shortness of breath. She called the office saying she would like to be seen because over the last week, she just can't climb the stairs in her house anymore without stopping for a break. So before we even go into the room, what types of problems should we be thinking of from a system standpoint? When, when you think about her, the first thing that jumps out is she's been smoking for 30 years, so she's obviously at risk for smoking-related lung disease. But she's also got long-standing hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, so heart disease, heart failure, hypertensive heart disease, those types of things need to be on the differential. But as you get older, there's also the possibility that she has metabolic derangements. You know, maybe she's developed acute renal failure, and that's slowly been progressing. Perhaps she's got anemia for some reason, and that's, that's a common one that we sometimes forget about, that, that low mm-hmm. hemoglobin can drive shortness of breath. As the least smart among us, I, I see a patient who has shortness of breath. I see a 30-pack year history of smoking. All I can think about is using my stethoscope on this patient. I can <laughs> fixate on nothing else. So anemia sounds great, but I'm not thinking about that. I'm just thinking about auscultating. I just want to listen for those sweet, sweet wheezes. <laughs> for, for you, a more nuanced doctor who actually has a nice broad differential and actually thinks about the patient. What kind of maneuvers are you thinking about that'll be sort of especially useful right out the gate for this particular patient? So I think the first thing that I start with is observation. I like to go out and meet the patient myself. You go out and you can see them in the waiting room. If they're sound asleep snoring and having apneic episodes, you've already diagnosed them with sleep apnea. Do they have to use their arms to lift themselves up out of the chair? And then as you're talking to them and you can start walking with them back to the clinic room, you stress the system. You can see if this person wasn't short of breath when I went out to meet them, did they get markedly short of breath as I was walking with them? I actually carry a pulse oximeter with me because I work in a pulmonary clinic. And so I'll oftentimes for a new patient just do an ambulatory sat as I'm walking them back to the patient room. They also get a neurologic examination. You get a gait exam. You get a sense of are there other systemic problems that are underlying this person's primary symptom. Uh, I think if we jump straight to auscultation, I, I think you're really at risk for losing a world of information. And really, when you put the stethoscope on the chest, many times you're really confirming what you already suspect or might even know from prior exam maneuvers, history, and observation. So I think we, we don't want to shortchange the rest of the physical exam by spending a lot of time talking about auscultation without talking about some of those other maneuvers, which I think in this particular patient would be as helpful, if not more helpful, than auscultation. When I'm teaching at the bedside for our residents or medical students, I'll ask, you know, what, what have you noticed about this person's respiratory rate? And if they say, oh... It, it's normal, I'll ask them, what is a normal respiratory rate? And invariably, you get someone who's going to say 12 to 20. If we all spend a a moment here, if we breathe every three seconds, you're going to realize very quickly, wow, I I feel kind of short of breath. But respiratory rate has actually turned out in many diseases and and COVID as well, it's actually a predictor of of worsening disease. In models in in our uh, patient population, respiratory rate is one of the single greatest predictors of progression to severe disease or death. Uh, And so if you look at patients who come in, if your respiratory rate's above 22, that portends badness as opposed to if it's 18 or less, you're you're probably in pretty good shape, at least for the moment. So I think respiratory rate is a free and easy one, and you can really pick up on an abnormality very quickly. If someone's got a respiratory rate of 22, where's the pneumonia, where's the heart failure, where's the fever, where's the metabolic acidosis, where's the anxiety, where's the pain? Something is abnormal, uh, and you need to explain why. The other one that's really powerful is asymmetric chest wall expansion. So I can remember very clearly doing my walk rounds at the end of the evening. You know, I wasn't even planning on going into patients' rooms. I was just kind of rounding at the end of the night before I went home. And there was one patient who had just been extubated that morning. And he was breathing a little bit fast, but he had actually taken his gown down because he was hot. And you can see that the right side of his chest was not moving at all. And so we went in there and, and confirmed that, you know, there was no expansion of his right chest. We tapped on his chest. He was actually hyper resonant and he had no breath sounds. And then we have portable ultrasound machines in our ICU. We, we threw, threw the machine on, and he had uh, a lung point. So he had clear evidence of a large pneumothorax that we actually knew just from looking at his chest, tapping on the chest, and feeling his chest. Uh, 
we were able to actually put the chest tube in before we even got a chest x-ray because we were so confident that that's what was going on. You grabbed the chest tube before you grabbed the stethoscope. <laughs> we did We did have a digital stethoscope that I did listen uh, for the absence count. of breath sense. But. <laughs> I wanted to, so it's, it, it seems like with this patient, you gave us the great tip that we're going to have met them in the waiting room. We're going to be watching, like looking at their neurologic exam, watching them walk. We're going to check their pulse ox on the way back to the room. We talked about the exam so far. Is there anything else that you think you would do for this lady? Before I listen, I'm looking for any asymmetry in the chest, and that's asymmetry in expansion, that's asymmetry in percussion. But I'm really trying to figure out, is there anything localized or asymmetric that would make me think this woman has an infection? And then when I listen, I think it's really important, not not just for listening, but also for observation and all the palpation and percussion we talked about. People are 3D objects, right? You know, they have a front side, they have a back side, they have side sides, right? And so... The times that I've completely missed the boat and looked at the chest x-ray and found the pneumonia that I didn't hear or palpate or percuss, it's when I forgot to look in, in common areas that we missed. If you don't listen in someone's side and if you don't listen anteriorly, you could be confident that they don't have a lower lobe process, but you could miss a whopping socked in middle lobe pneumonia or a lingular pneumonia. So I think it's really important to be systematic when you're looking for something like an infection. And in those patients, sometimes, to be honest, ultrasound is really, really helpful because you may not be able to do a good posterior exam, but the ultrasound uh, can penetrate and, and tell you if there's something going on uh, uh, posterior laterally. So this is great, and this is a lot of information. And, and maybe a way to recap, Dr. Garibaldi, can you go through, when we have the patient in the room, what are some of the maneuvers that you're thinking of when you're going through that differential Which ones seem to be the ones that are really going to help guide clinical decision-making? And which ones maybe are ones that are a wasted time or are not as useful as others? Sure. I think the most important thing is is observation, you know, looking to see are they short of breath at rest? Do they get short of breath when we stress the system? I think that, that tells you that you're in the right ballpark, that there's something going on, usually cardiopulmonary. I'm going to start I'm going to look at the hands. I'm going to look for for anemia. I'm going to look for cardiovascular disease by examining pulses. I'm going to look for any signs of systemic inflammation in the hands or signs of chronic lung disease. For worried about heart failure, I'm definitely going to look for low extremity edema. I'm going to assess the chest, looking to see if they have a laterally displaced PMI. I'm going to look at the jugular venous pressure. I'm going to feel the carotids. I'm going to feel the chest for symmetry when I'm worried about a focal process like a pneumonia. Uh, or some sort of a mass, then I'm going to percuss the chest looking again for asymmetry because it's that asymmetry that that really kind of guides you toward an an abnormal process. And then I'm going to use auscultation to try to better understand are there focal findings, are there diminished breath sounds, are there crackles in one particular area versus another. They're less helpful for heart failure because the absence of them doesn't help, but you know, if you hear focal crackles and maybe you have changes in egophony, perhaps there's a consolidation or, or bronchiectasis in some area that could clue you in. And then I'm going to listen to the heart. You know, I'm going to listen for any clear valvular pathology. I'm going to listen for extra heart sounds that could lead us uh, down the path of heart failure. So those are sort of the general things that I'd be thinking about. And then additional maneuvers would be guided by what else we get in the history. When you're doing a physical exam, you're not doing it in a vacuum, right? When you can talk to somebody, you're really trying to, to come up with what's a hypothesis-driven physical examination, based on what my pretest probabilities are, which are defined by who the person is, what they're experiencing, and what they tell you, that really is going to help you narrow down the maneuvers that are going to help move that needle. And I think in this particular patient, the, the two leading things we're worried about are heart failure versus some sort of smoking-related lung disease, either COPD or maybe interstitial lung disease from smoking. And I think our physical exam can really try to help us rule in or rule out heart failure and try to understand if there are findings that go along with obstructive lung disease or interstitial lung disease. All right. So so I want to give out some numbers to the team and, and we'll just see how everyone responds. Our producer, Sam Master, collated evidence on test characteristics on some of the most common maneuvers for shortness of breath. Uh, and these include things like reduced breath sounds, crackles, wheezing, jugular venous distension, and lower extremity edema. So first, reduced breath sounds. So when looking for a pleural effusion, reduced breath sounds have a likelihood ratio of 6.5. So 6.5, this is pretty good. Looking for a pleural effusion with reduced breath sounds. Next up, crackles. So for pneumonia, crackles have a likelihood ratio of 2.3, uh, while for heart failure, crackles have a likelihood ratio of 1.6. And for pleural effusion, crackles have a likelihood ratio of just 0.7. How about wheezing? For pneumonia, wheezing has a likelihood ratio of 
For COPD, wheezing has a likelihood ratio of 2.6. And for asthma, wheezing has a likelihood ratio of 6.0. There are also common maneuvers used to measure volume status and assess for heart failure. And when assessing for heart failure, the jugular venous distension has a likelihood of a ratio of about 3.9, while lower extremity edema has a likelihood ratio of 1.4. So what do people think? What do people think of these? So my, my initial impression of all, of all the things that you just mentioned with the exception of, of jugular venous distension, a lot of what you've laid out really relies on auscultation. I think if we jump straight to auscultation when we were talking earlier, I, I think you're really at risk for, lo- for losing a world of information. For a lot of the times when I'm trying to do a volume status exam on a patient with heart failure, I'm really listening closely for crackles, and that might not be the first thing uh, to do, whereas the jugular venous distension is a relatively higher likelihood ratio. And I think that reinforces the idea of really trying to learn how to do that exam, which does take a little bit of practice and skill. Well, I think it's important to to try to think of the physiology behind some of these maneuvers too, right? So, you know, someone who's got chronic heart failure, they probably have hypertrophied lymphatics and they can have a much higher pulmonary capillary wedge pressure or left atrial pressure and not have crackles. Whereas if one of us had the same left atrial pressure as someone who has chronic heart failure, we would immediately be intubated and flash pulmonary edema in the intensive care unit. So some of these sort of make sense that they're not quite as sensitive diagnosing heart failure. And, you know, quite honestly, while COPD patients have reduced breath sounds, they also have early inspiratory crackles. That actually has a likelihood ratio associated with COPD. I I would say for for some of those, it it does get down to practice though, right? So so I am very, very confident that if someone has a moderate pleural fusion, I will pick it up without a stethoscope or without an ultrasound machine. But I've practiced a lot. That's where some of the limitations of, of the evidence might be. There's been a decline in physical exam skills over the years. The limitations of some of these studies is that we don't know what the exam skills of the examiners were. A lot of these studies comparing someone who got extensive training for six months in ultrasound to a practicing physician to see who gets the heart murmur correct, they're sort of biased towards someone who just got six months of extensive training in ultrasound, but didn't actually get the same level of intensity of training in in their physical exam skills. A nice thing I think about books like Steve McGee's is that he really kind of pairs it down. You know, there's 15 things you could do to look for ascites, but he really narrows it down to just four things that move the needle by 25% or more. That, that's that's what I try to focus on in terms of the maneuvers that I practice, but also what, I, what I'll spend time teaching yeah. to others. We talk, we're talking about the likelihood ratios, and I don't know if we said it yet, but I think it's helpful. So the, the likelihood ratio of 10 is really going to change. 10 or higher is like really good. It's going to drastically change the post-test probability, right? Five is like a medium change in your post-test probability. Less than five is not not as great. A lot of the ones, Justin, that, that you had pointed out there were between one and five. So wh- what cutoff should we be looking for? And did you have any clever name for that? Matthew, that's such a great question. <laughs> um, because in fact, some maneuvers have evidence that is wildly impressive. And we have therefore created a section in each episode called the over six, under six maneuvers. We have a list of maneuvers that we're calling the oversits undersits because they will have a likelihood ratio of greater than 6.0 or a likelihood of less than 0.6, which means that they will have very significant changes in your pretest probability to post-test probability. These are maneuvers that in previous studies have really demonstrated things that can change the needle. And so a few short examples, all of which will be in these show notes. First, asymmetric chest wall expansion for pneumonia, likelihood ratio of 44. Similar asymmetric chest wall expansion for a pleural effusion has a likelihood ratio of 8.2. Hyper resonance on percussion for COPD, a likelihood ratio of 7.3. Reduced breath sounds for COPD, a likelihood ratio, a negative likelihood ratio of 0.5. We talked about wheezing for asthma have a li- having a likelihood ratio of six. And then a couple for heart failure that I thought really are big maneuvers that can help diagnose heart failure. The first, hepatojugular reflux for heart failure has a positive likelihood ratio of eight, a negative likelihood ratio of 0.3. An abnormal valsalva for heart failure has a likelihood ratio of 7.8, negative likelihood ratio of 0.1. A displaced apical impulse for heart failure has a positive likelihood ratio of 5.8, a negative likelihood ratio of 0.4. Finally, as Dr. Darabaldi mentioned, anemia is something that can cause shortness of breath. 
And sure enough, uh, while pallor for anemia has a likelihood ratio of 3.5, the negative likelihood ratio is 0.5. The likelihood ratio for pallor in the palmar crease is 7.8. And pallor for conjunctival rim has a likelihood ratio of 16.7. So we should be looking at eyelids more often. Finally, in inpatients with respiratory symptoms, diminished tactile frematist or diminished focal resonance has a likelihood ratio of 6.3 for pleural effusion or a negative likelihood ratio of 0.3. In some of these maneuvers, it made me think when I am looking at a patient and assessing for heart failure, I need to be checking hepatojugular reflux, abnormal valsalva, and a displaced apical impulse because these maneuvers seem to have impressive test characteristics. What are your interpretations of some of these numbers? Yeah, so the first thing I'm struck by is that most of the maneuvers that made it to your over six and under six are actually not auscultation, right? Most of them are either visual or some sort of dynamic maneuver where you palpate something or you, you, you stress the system and, and you, you get a response. So I think that's really important to remember that a lot of the high yield maneuvers for cardiac and pulmonary are actually not auscultation. What I will say is that some of these are, are a little bit complicated. So to do the abnormal Valsalva correctly and to be confident that you've ruled in heart failure or ruled out heart failure, I think takes a lot of practice. There's only one physician I know at our hospital that does this, and he does it really, really well. But, you know, he actually carries around a special device that patients will blow into so that you maintain 40 millimeters of mercury Valsalva for 10 seconds so that you know that they actually did a Valsalva maneuver. It's actually very hard to reproduce, but if you can do it, it, it probably is a useful test. I personally don't do it because I just don't have the confidence that I can get my patients to do an appropriate Valsalva for 10 seconds. You and need then, a manual blood pressure cuff too, right? Yeah, you do need a manual blood pressure cuff. There are some automated ones I think that can do it, but they're not very, very common. So I think that one, while the performance characteristics are really good if you've been trained to do it, I think that's probably not one that I would go out and say everyone should learn how to do this. Whereas the patajugger reflux, I mean, I think it's a pretty easy maneuver, but it's commonly done incorrectly. So if, if you press on someone's belly, and some people call this the abdominal jugular reflux, because if you have someone who's got right heart failure, you press on their liver, they're going to be upset with you. <laughs> so you can press anywhere over the belly. Everyone should have an increase in their jugular venous pressure for a few cardiac cycles when you press on their belly and you increase splanchnic blood flow. You basically give them a, a fluid bolus. But what you're looking for is you're looking for a sustained elevation of four centimeters when you hold sustained pressure for 10 seconds. And if you see that sustained elevation as you're holding sustained pressure, and then oftentimes what I'll do to confirm that is I'll just look to see when I let go of that pressure, does, do you see that uh, descent in the jugular venous pressure? That tells you that someone's filling pressures are high. And it turns out it's not specific for right heart failure, even though it was first described with tricuspid regurgitation. It's not specific for right-sided filling pressures. It actually could be either left or right-sided filling pressures. But that, that gives you a sense that someone has high filling pressures. And I, I love looking for the apical impulse. I think when you find someone who has a laterally displaced apical impulse, you know, lateral to the midclavicular line, that you can be fairly confident that, that they, they have a reduced ejection fraction and or high filling pressures. The problem is you, all of these findings for reduced ejection fraction in particular, you can have an EF that's low and not have any of these findings. So the absence of those findings, not super helpful, but if I find it, if I find someone who's got a, a, a displaced apical impulse, when I was already thinking that my differential is heart failure, then I'm pretty confident that that person has heart failure. The other thing that's nice about particularly these maneuvers for heart failure is that not only are they diagnostic potentially, but they're also prognostic. If you have someone with ischemic heart disease and they have a displaced apical impulse or if they have an S3 on auscultation or if they have small sign, which is that inspiratory rise in your jugular venous pressure that's abnormal, those patients with the same EF, if you have one of those findings, your one-year mortality is significantly increased. So not only are they diagnostic maneuvers, but they potentially could be prognostic maneuvers. And these have been shown in multiple clinical trials looking at different heart failure drugs. Your physical exam and, and those findings actually predict mortality just as well as biomarkers, just as well as echocardiograms. So I think we should try to make this a little bit specific to our patient. And just to recap what we talked about so far, for to check our patient for heart failure, we'll look at her jugular venous pulsations. And if, if we can see that the jugular venous pressure looks like it's like up to her mandible, probably the hepatojugular reflux isn't going to add a lot. But if we don't see the jugular venous uh, pressure being elevated, we hold pressure for 10 seconds and look for a four centimeter rise and see if that's sustained through that 10 seconds that we have our hand on the patient's 
abdomen, and we're not going to press on their liver if they have uh, if they have an enlarged liver, right sided heart failure. And then we're also going to feel for the apical impulse, probably on every patient, so that when we feel one that's actually displaced, we'll know what abnormal feels like. So those are for heart failure. And maybe unless you're this one guy at Hopkins that's carrying around, <laughs> probably Paul Williams has one of those too. But probably not going to do the ab- ch- check for abnormal valsalva. When I was reading about it, I was like, "This sounds. This is a. This sounds like quite a thing." <laughs> but what a test! It's what a test. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it depends on uh, someone's baseline skin tone, right? So just pallor in general is a subjective thing. If you've never seen someone before, it, sure, it, it, it's hard to know. Um, for someone who's lighter skinned. Uh, I do look for palmar crease pallor as part of my approach to the hands. So I, I think the hands are really very, very high yield in somebody who's short of breath because you can look for clubbing, you can look for splinter hemorrhages, you can look for uh, signs of arthritis that could be part of an autoimmune disease. You can look for palmar crease pallor, which can tell you if someone has the, the possibility of anemia. If, if it's an equivocal finding there, I will jump to the eyelids and look to see if they have conjunctival rim pallor to understand if they might be anemic. And again, that could be driving their shortness of breath or it could be part of a uh, you know, systemic process. I, I look for um, an interface dermatitis or mechanics hands that you might see in someone who's got an autoimmune-related lung disease. So I think the hands are, are just a wealth of information. So I always start with the hands, looking at the nail beds, looking for you know abnormal nail changes that could go with chronic disease. While I'm doing that, I'm also going to check a pulse, right? Because you can get a, a really good sense right away. If someone's tachycardic, that increases the likelihood that they have some sort of cardiopulmonary insufficiency. Uh, and I'll do that bilaterally too to get a sense of whether or not they might have peripheral vascular disease or some some abnormality that gives someone asymmetric pulses. So I think those are all pretty easy to do. You can do them in you know, 10 seconds or less uh, and get a really good sense of what's going on systemically. And then I really just march my way up the upper extremities. You know, I'll, I'll check, before I check the jugular venous pressure, I always check the carotids because the carotids are your window into timing a murmur. If there's going to be one, you can feel for asymmetry, which tells you about vascular disease. If you suspect aortic valvular disease, the carotid pulsations can actually help you figure out if someone's likely to have aortic stenosis, if they have diminished or delayed carotids, or you can rule out carotid uh, aortic stenosis if someone has bounding carotid pulses. But unfortunately, most people with moderate aortic stenosis have quote-unquote normal carotids, so they may or may not be helpful. Uh, but I sort of make that part of everything that I do before I look at that jugular venous pressure. And then I move to the chest, and I, I really combine my chest exam with both pulmonary and cardiac maneuvers. So I will you know, inspect the chest looking for that symmetry that we talked about earlier. I actually do percuss anteriorly if, if I'm suspicious of COPD because the loss of that superficial cardiac dullness actually goes along with someone who's hyperinflated. And so that has a, a pretty good likelihood ratio. I think it might meet your six over six, under six criteria. I can't remember we'll the exact we'll number, but we'll, we'll get it in there. But if you lose that superficial cardiac dullness, that could be a sign of hyperinflation. And so I kind of do all of that at the same time. And then I, I will finally move on to, to auscultation. And how about things like labs and diagnostic imaging? I think physical exam today, we're just going through the motions. It's like, why do an auscultation? We're trying to do the chest that's right anyway. Or why are we doing the volume status exam when we're going to get a pro BNP? We're going to get a echo I think a lot of this depends on context. So for example, if it's the end of the day in clinic and the patient looks pretty well, they're saturating okay on room air, and the only way to get labs is to send them to the emergency department, you may not get labs that day. You may be able to to use your exam to decide, all right, I think this is heart failure. I'm going to do a, a trial of diuretic and I'm going to call the patient in a day or two and, and see if the the use of that medication helped me confirm that diagnosis that I already knew about. Uh, but sometimes labs will be important, right? If you're worried about someone who's got chronic hypertensive heart disease and maybe uh, they have a little bit of edema, you're worried about renal function, are you going to want to check a creatinine, especially if you're going to be diuresing them to understand do they have end organ damage? So I think it really, a lot of it is based on context, but I'm not sure in this particular case how helpful labs are going to be because, you know, for example, an elevated pro BMP, you know, the likelihood ratio is not that much better than you know, if you have a laterally displaced PMI and an S3 and an elevated drug venous pressure. The BMP in that sense doesn't help me at all. I already knew that the person had heart failure. Now, if, if I didn't really know, let's say some of the findings weren't present, I was having difficulty seeing the drug venous pressure for whatever reason, the patient didn't have low extremity edema, 
a negative or a, a low pro-BMP would be very helpful, right? It makes it unlikely that that person has heart failure. So that might be a helpful test to try to help me in, in a, a person where I'm having a little bit of a trouble eliciting the, the findings that I think are helpful to, to rule in or rule out heart failure. But in general, I don't think it's going to be all that helpful. Chest x-rays in clinic, oftentimes we're talking about hours to days turnaround or sending the patient from your clinic to somewhere else. But if the person's been progressively more short of breath and you have objective findings of heart failure, you're not going to wait for a chest x-ray or an echocardiogram to start Lasix and to start managing their heart failure appropriately or to even begin the workup looking for ischemic disease. And so I think your initial foray into what am I going to do right now with this person who's short of breath in front of me, you're probably not going to have the time to get those tests before you have to make a decision. Am I treating the COPD? Am I treating the heart failure? Am I treating the pneumonia? I think oftentimes we, we have this over-reliance on labs and particularly when we're training in the hospital where we have labs all around us, we start using the labs in place of the information that we would have gotten actually in real time faster if we were in our outpatient practice or if we were you know, not dealing with a hospitalized patient. What about with an ultrasound, handheld ultrasound, distinguishing CHF versus COPD or, or some other causes of shortness of breath? What are like the most high yield things that you think would be attainable for someone that's like, Maybe they're going to get a, a year, like in infrequent touches on an ultrasound, but but they're going to get some training. I think probably the easiest thing is is there a large pleural effusion? You know that's really really good with ultrasound, and and even though you can get to ninety percent sensitivity specificity with just your hands and a stethoscope, you can get up into the really high nineties, ninety eight, ninety nine percent sensitive and specific for smaller amounts of fluid if you use a handheld ultrasound, and it's pretty easy to train someone to to recognize pockets of fluid. The other thing that's that's not as difficult as you might think is is determining if someone has a a low normal or low or normal EF. So you can pick up someone who's got a reduced ejection fraction pretty easily with with a minimal, you know, you, you probably need to do 20 or so exams to be able to be confident to do it. So I think that would be helpful. It's really easy in the lung ultrasound to pick up B lines, which oftentimes can be related to pulmonary edema. So if you had a reduced EF and B lines, you're done. This is probably heart failure. Although you can get fooled. Someone could have interstitial lung disease or an interstitial pneumonia and have B lines. So, so that's not pathognomonic for heart failures. And then pericardial fusion, which, you know, there really is no nothing on your exam that you can do to confirm that someone has a pericardial fusion. You certainly can have a suspicion they have tamponade if you knew they had an effusion, but you can put a probe on really, really quickly and know if someone's got a pericardial fusion. Uh, and that's something that I don't, I don't think you can do without ultrasound or some imaging modality. What you can't do with the ultrasound, you can't see wheeze, right? You can't see a pericardial friction rub. And so you're not going to be able to replace some of these other findings that we already said had high yield, like wheezing for asthma, for example. So I, I think it, it's it's not going to replace the stethoscope completely, but with some training, you can get pretty good pretty quickly at those basic maneuvers. Right. So if this patient, we slap the ultrasound on, they have greater than three B lines bilaterally in multiple rib spaces. They have a pleural effusion when you look above the liver and uh, the spleen. This is probably not a COPD exacerbation. This is probably heart failure. But if you see A lines everywhere and they were already hyper resonant when you're percussing, then you're pretty confident this is probably COPD if those are the two main things on your differential. Yeah, I think it could be pretty helpful there. But again, I, I, I would say that the ultrasound in that case is probably confirming that which you already had a pretty good suspicion of prior to right. putting the probe on. Um, yeah, yeah uh, Paul, we talk about this a lot on the show. We just want one test that's just like, <laughs> just tell me what the patient <laughs> tell has. Tell us the answer. <laughs> yeah. The quote-unquote clinical <laughs> diagnostic test. Yeah, there's no perfect test. So you always have to interpret it in context, and there's always multiple points. That's the, the art of medicine part of this. So, Paul, do you want to take us home with the, the last part of this case here? Sure. So we're back with Mrs. Huffington. Ah, yes. Excellent name. She reports that she's had a dry cough. She has the occasional audible wheeze. She initially thought she had a cold because of the runny nose and just assumed it would get better, but the nose has improved and she still cannot climb the flight of stairs without feeling dyspneic. She also reports she's having trouble sleeping. She's having a hard time catching her breath when she's lying flat. Here's the key point, um, because of course it is five o'clock on a Friday afternoon and we have to make some kind of decision. The lab is closed. So this is Admit, not admit, but more importantly, diagnostically, what are we doing with here? Is this a patient who has CHF, obstructive lung disease? Do we need to send her to the ER for further workup? So how do we absolutely nail this diagnosis with a physical examination? So I think at this point, 
you know, I'd go back to the things we already said we'd want to do, right? Does she have an elevated jugular venous pressure? Does she have a lateral PMI? Does she have hepatojugular reflux? Does she have low extremity edema? Because she might fall into this category that all that is wheezing is not asthma, right? This could be cardiac wheeze. The orthopnea, it turns out, is not incredibly helpful because many people with lung disease as well as heart disease can have orthopnea, people with diaphragm problems, people with obesity. So it's not specific for heart failure, although the absence of orthopnea would argue against heart failure. So I think she's still in that category. I think we could probably sort this out with a physical exam. And then depending on how she looks, that's when you decide, do I need to send her to the emergency department? I mean, if she's satting okay on room air and you have a plan in place to do a trial diuretics because you think this is heart failure. But I, I think with those maneuvers that we talked about, you should probably be able to, to get to the point where you can make a decision, I'm going to treat this as a heart failure exacerbation and see how she does over the next 24, 48 hours, or I'm going to treat this as a COPD flare and see how she does over the next 24 to 48 hours, assuming that she's stable enough to go home. So you would not diurese and give steroids? Uh, and fluid at the same time. <laughs> I and, and, some, and I think it is important to remember, too, that, that uh, time is an important diagnostic tool, right? And so you know, your initial pretest probability is now modified. You think she has diagnosis X. If you treat her as such and she gets better, that confirms your diagnosis and makes it even much more likely that you were correct. And if she's not getting better, then you have to rethink, where did I go wrong? Did I misinterpret something? Is there more data that I need? And then you you go to sort of the next level of testing. So we've gone through a lot of stuff here. For people who are really interested in learning physical exam, any specific advice that you'd give to them? I think the most important thing is to practice and to be really intentional about how you practice. If the only time you ever do a specific exam maneuver is when you suspect that a person might have the disease, you're probably not going to be comfortable enough in that maneuver to confidently interpret the findings, right? You're not going to know, hey, that there's asymmetry and dullness or the chest is not expanding the right way. So practicing on healthy people or people who don't have the abnormality is just as important as seeking out the patient who has a specific finding of interest. And so I'd say practice, try to put together what you've seen with your patients with those physical exam maneuvers and just ask other people, you know, particularly when you're in an environment where you have colleagues around if you don't know what something is, you know, chances are one of your colleagues might. So take the time if you can. I know people are really, really busy. Take the time to say, hey, I'm not sure what that is, but I know it's not something I've seen before. Let me figure out if this is relevant and important. And, and I can't tell you how many times I've benefited from popping into the next exam room and saying, hey, you know, can you just come look at this patient with me? I don't know what this is, and I'm hoping you might. And, and so I think asking for help is a really, really good one. And then the other thing that to, to remember, which we haven't really emphasized, is that If you're interested in some part of the body, you actually have to look at that part of the body. And so you're doing yourself a disservice if you're going stethoscope fishing, you know, pulling the shirt out and dropping the stethoscope down and hoping you snag the heart. I promise you, you're going to be missing stuff, right? So if you really care about what the exam is going to show, make sure you do it properly. Make sure you you put yourself in the right position to be able to see the right findings and interpret the right findings. Anything you'd like to plug, Dr. Gerbold? Anything that we should uh, send our listeners to to, to check out? Sure. I, th- I think if you're interested in learning more about physical exam maneuvers, there's a couple great resources that you can look at in addition to the ones we've already highlighted. The first, I would say go check out the Stanford 25. They have a, a number of really high quality, high production value videos on different physical exam techniques. And then also, if you have a chance, check out the Society of Bedside Medicine website, bedsidemedicine.org where we have a number of links to useful clinical skills resources, but also something we call the five-minute moment, which is a way of teaching a specific physical exam maneuver or technique grounded in history, but also in the evidence behind that maneuver to help you and your learners remember one salient feature of the patients that you're seeing together. Awesome. Cool. Thank you so much for joining us, uh, Dr. Garibaldi. This was amazing. I think this is really helpful. Uh, A great first show to, to kick off the physical exam series. I was so happy to be here. Hope, hope to get to do it again. Awesome. Thanks so much. This has been another episode of The Curbsiders, bringing you a little knowledge food for your brain hole. Yummy. Get your show notes at The Curbsiders. Oh, 
I thought I could make it through. Get your get your show notes at thecurbsiders.com forward slash podcast and sign up for our mailing list at thecurbsiders.com forward slash knowledge food to get our weekly show notes in your inbox. That's right, Paul. Our dynamic, dedicated team delivers to you high value, practice changing information. To do that, we need your humorous, highbrow and hilarious feedback. So please subscribe, rate and review the show from wherever you consume your podcasts or shoot us some electronic mail to thecurbsiders at gmail.com. An inordinate thanks goes to our producers for this episode, Sam Masser and Justin Burke. And to our social media team, Beth Garbs Garbatelli on the Twits, Maddie Mad Dog Morgan on the Gram, and Chris the Chew Man Chew on the Book of Faces. There still exists stunning silence on both Snapchat and TikTok. <laughs> Till we meet again, I'm Stuart Kent Brigham. Good night. Thanks everyone for tuning in. This episode was made with the assistance of the Society of Bedside Medicine and funding from the New York Academy of Medicine. Tonight, I have been Justin Lee Burke. Paul, I'm pretty sure Stuart was just crafting that the entire episode. <laughs> Oh, 100%. Yeah, that's written on a separate screen and was read verbatim. I have no question. Well, until next time, I've been Dr. Matthew Frank Watto. And we would be remiss if we did not thank the great Stuart Brigham for composing the theme music that you're presumably hearing right now, as well as to thanking Claire Morgan of Notterly for editing our audio. As always, our main Dr. Paul Nelson Williams. Thank you and goodbye. You know, I had to take off my headphones so I couldn't hear you during that, or I would have been the stuttering. God. That was great, Stuart. Thank you. It's good to have you back. And thanks to our partner, VCU Health Continuing Education, who's helping us offer free CE credits for physicians and other healthcare professionals. Check out curbsiders.vcuhealth.org for more information. 